after nearly 100 years of war, the British sued for peace, and peace treaties were signed with the Windward Maroons and the Leeward Maroons in 1739. Uh, one of the leaders of the, of the Maroons towards the east, Grandi Nani, um, was said to have refused to participate in the, in the negotiations because she didn't fully trust the British. For a number of years in Jamaica after 1739, there was peace um, until there was an eruption again in 1795. This was a local conflict. In 1795, the Maroons of Trelawney Town, which were in Catholic country, had a number of grouses with the British government, including the allocation of land that they got, um, had some difficulties over their supervisors. And in one particular incident, the Maroons of Trelawney Town had caught a runaway slave and carried him back to the British authorities. Sometime later, two Maroons from Trelawney Town were convicted of pig stealing and they were sentenced to be lashed. But in order to embarrass them even further, the colonial authorities decided to use the same runaway slave that they had returned to inflict the lashing on them. And that was a disgrace or an insult too much for the, the Maroons of Trelawney Town to bear and they again rose up in rebellion. Um, that lasted for a few months until the British authorities went to Cuba and brought in the dogs that they used to hunt maroons in Cuba to hunt down the trail of the town maroons. Um, these dogs were very effect used very effectively in hunting, in hunting maroons in Cuba. And uh, when they were brought to Jamaica, the trail of the town maroons, they surrendered very shortly thereafter. Those were the maroons that were then taken away and sent to Nova Scotia and Canada and later to Sierra Leone in Africa. It is believed that some of them would have um, come back to Jamaica in the early 19th century, but um, that has never been proven. What is left of Trelawney Town today is a community called Flagstaff in St. In, in, in St. James. Flagstaff was a British garrison that was built up on Trelawney Town after they had taken away all of the, all of the Trelawney Maroons. Um, since then, there has been no more Maroon let us say, troubles in Jamaica. And the Maroons have existed in their four communities fairly peacefully and pretty much out of the way of most Jamaicans. When you look at all of these treaties, though, that the Maroons signed right across the Caribbean, the issue that, as I said, stands out is the whole issue of them having to return runaway slaves. And that is a big question and a major problem for a number of Jamaicans. Because a number of Jamaicans find it hard to bring themselves to deal with the fact that here are these Maroons who are seen as freedom fighters. Here are these Maroons who are seen as, you know, the ultimate resistance to slavery. Here are these Maroons who are supposed to be glorified, who are supposed to be heroic. Grandi Nani is one of our national heroes. Yet, here it is that these very same persons who resisted slavery for so long would have then agreed to unsign a treaty that said, we will agree to no longer have a runaway says We'll agree, in fact, to form part of the local militia that will suppress slaves, that will go after slaves. And in Jamaica, certainly in 1760, with Taki's re re uh, revolt, the Maroons played a big part in suppressing that. Sam Sharp, the, um, his Christmas rebellion, the Maroons played a role in suppressing that. Even post-slavery, with Paul Bogle and the Moran Bay rebellion, the Maroons played a significant role in suppressing that. So there's that very serious issue that a lot of Jamaicans have to grapple with, but it's not just an issue that affects the Jamaica Maroons. Virtually all the Maroon groups across the Caribbean signed similar treaties. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is what do we make of that in terms of resistance? Well, a number of thoughts. As I said, some people have seen it as flat out betrayal, as flat out disloyalty. Um, another way to think of it is, as I said, simply that, and this, this really operates in all aspects of life, is that people are going to do what is in their own self-interest. People are going to do what is in their own self-interest. And here are these moral groups who have had their independence recognized. And they're saying, well, what do we have to do to prevent any further trouble? And they agreed to this treaty because it's, it will, for them, be an end to their particular problems. Well, some might argue, well, what happened to the solidarity with other blacks? I've heard um, a Maroon colonel tell me, um, there's their own stories about being betrayed by enslaved blacks. 
because the British and Spaniards in their territories used enslaved blacks to hunt maroons. One, as I said, the same maroon colonel tells, tells a story that is passed on in maroon oral tradition of black slaves going, leading the British into maroon, secret maroon territories in the hills. And once their territories were discovered, the maroons had to leave very rapidly. Sometimes they'd have to leave children behind. They would leave the babies behind. And sometimes what they would do is even have to, well, according to the tradition, to cut the Achilles tendon of all of their young children so that the young children wouldn't have to run after them. So they are saying that these are the types of decisions that sometimes they had to make. And because of that tremendous loss, which would have been caused because black slaves would have pointed the British to their homes, you can understand why there was always this, this, this sympathy between all black groups in the Caribbean. So that is another thing that you have to think about. That from the earliest times of, of conquest, colonizers have been playing off groups of the oppressed against each other. So black shots were trained slaves who went and hunted the Maroons and betrayed their locations. And similarly, the Maroons, after they signed their treaties, returned runaway slaves. So you have a whole lot of that going on. Why would black slaves have worked with British militias to hunt down Maroons? Again, because of whatever rewards or improvement in status that would have given them. So all throughout history, we, we kind of would like to think, we would wish there was this kind of black solidarity, this kind of solidarity against, um, across all communities of black enslaved Africans. But this wasn't the case. It's not the case in, in almost any society that you ever look at. Persons will do what is in their best interest, and that certainly was the case with the Maroons. Um, I want to talk now a bit about maroon, about maroon economic culture um, and politics. Because of the maroon, because the maroons lived in these remote environments, they had to make best use of what the environment offered them. I already showed or spoke to you a bit about how they used the terrain to their advantage in terms of their guerrilla warfare, in terms of hiding out, in terms of being able to escape the British, but they and the, Sp and the Spanish. Um, but they also had to make use of materials from their environment. A number of the things that they did would have been informed by their own African traditions. But they would also have learned a lot from the indigenous Americans that they came across. Here is, is um, anybody can guess what this is? What is it? Huh? Sinking pot, right. They, are, they have another version called a fish pot, which is actually much, much narrow in shape. But this is a singing pattern that was used to catch fish. Um, it's a very interesting construction. Anybody know what that material will be made out of? Bamboo. Bamboo. Actually, how it is made is they take, they take the root of the, a banana tree. You cut a, a big section of the trunk of a banana tree. And then they slice the bamboo extremely thinly. And after they slice the bamboo thinly, they, they stick bamboo in a circle around into the, into the banana trunk. So you have a circle of bamboo sticking up. Then they take other strands of bamboo, again cut extremely thinly so they fly. And they interweave it, interweave it, interweave it all the way up. And then they start to get, as it goes up, it gets wider and wider and wider. And then they actually turn the pot, which is turned over, and then they weave it back to the other end. And that is how you end up with the sinking pot. And then you use this to catch fish. I brought these with me today. This longer one is called a junga or a spear. And this would have been used for what? On fish in shallow water. Also, um, would have, what, what was one of the most popular animals that the maroons of Portland would have hunted? What's that? I hear it. Wild hog. And wild hog, for those of you who haven't tried it, is, is delicious actually. So this is the junga or spear. This one. What is this one? For uh, the Maroons of, of, of Morton, the Portan call this the Buta. And Buta, B-U-T-T-A, is probably the closest spelling I can think of. So we have the junga, we have the Buta. What would the Buta have been used for? Take a guess. What's that? This would have been used for spearing fish and crayfish. Or what's another, what would they have called crayfish? 